OK, I think we're probably ready to get started. Good morning. Uh, this is Christopher Constant. Uh, this is a meeting of the Municipality Bankers Assembly Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee of the Whole for October 15th, 2020 from 11 to 12. It's a virtual meeting and we have one item on the agenda today in earnest, which is the Eklutna hydroelectric project. But before we get to that, um, Madam Clerk, would you please take the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Allard? Here. Mr. Constant? Here. Mr. Dunbar? I see Mr. Dunbar. Uh, Ms. Kennedy? Here. Ms. LaFrance? Mr. Peterson? Present. Mr. Perez Verdia? Ms. Quinn Davidson? Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Weddleton? Ms. Alatel? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. So we are prepared now to take on the question of the report from Chugach Electric on the Eklutna Hydroelectric Project. And so uh, with that, I would like to hand this over to um, Chugach Electric, either Lee or Julie. It, the floor is yours. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Good afternoon. Um, Julie Haskett here from Chugach. We are um, presenting on behalf of all of the owners the update to the assembly members on what's been done on the Eklutna Hydro project over the summer and kind of some next steps and a look at some uh, definitions when we're talking about the project and what um, what geographically can and, and cannot happen. So we just want to try to come to you more often, maybe quarterly, and give you updates on how things are going. So thank you for giving us this time. And um, the presenters for the project today are going to be Samantha Owens, who works for McMillan Jacobs, they're leading the consulting for this whole project on behalf of all of the owners. Um, McMillan Jacobs is a Northwest Hydro consulting firm, and they've done a lot of work in Alaska. So Samantha's going to do the first part, and then Brian Hickey, our COO at Chugach, is going to present the second part. And with that, before uh, Samantha kicks in, I just want to see if Lee wants to say anything. I don't want to overstep my CEO. I believe I'm figure out how to run this thing. But anyway, I just want to welcome everybody. Um, it's it's a privilege to be able to keep the assembly um, updated on this important project. And just if you guys questions, please just raise your hand and let us know what they are. So anyway, take it away, Samantha. Awesome. This is, before you go, Samantha, for the purposes of good order, I will take the questions from folks. I have kind of the setup where I can see it. So you can raise your hand. You can put your name in the chat if you have that function available and that's how we'll proceed. Thanks. Great. And then Brian, um, I think you're going to operate the PowerPoint for me. So we're going to we're going to do teamwork yep. here. I will do that right now. I'm this is my first time at Microsoft Teams. So give me a minute here. I'm going to share the PowerPoint. No problem. Um, well, well, Brian is getting started. Here. Ms. Owen, for the record, Ms. Quinn Davidson has arrived to the meeting. OK. And then uh, while Brian is figuring out the PowerPoint, um, I'll just reintroduce myself. My name is Samantha Owen. I work for McMillan Jacobs Associates. I'm based out of uh, Seattle, Washington, um, and I'm the project manager for the consultant team for our efforts in complying with the 1991 agreement and uh, most of the efforts that we have ongoing to date and going forward. So happy to take any of your questions um, when we get to that. But uh, it looks like oh, Brian has the PowerPoint up. And we're going to get back to the beginning. There we are. All right. So you, got the, you guys can all see the PowerPoint now. One, one quick question. This is Mr. Constant. Could somebody email a copy of this to us so that we could have it put up on the website uh, in that way? The public can have access to it who might not be able to see it. So um, Julie has my email. 
Yep. We also sent it to Desiree yesterday. So if that's appropriate for her to share it. It yeah, is definitely. posted online already. All right, thank you. Perfect. Great. All right, well then we'll just, uh, we'll jump right in. Um, so like Julie said, we're gonna provide you an update on the activities that we've, uh, that we've conducted since February 2020, the last time uh, the project owners got to give you guys an update on what's going on. Um, and then Brian is gonna give you a review of the project facilities and operations. And we'll have some Q&A. Next slide. So real quick, um, we just wanted to give you a, a little overview of the occlutenate area. I think we maybe showed this to you last time, but just to refresh everyone's memory, because I think it's a very good visual representation of the stakeholders that are involved in this project. So you, you can see in the in the lower right hand corner there, we have um, the, the two red dots are the dam itself, the project dam and the project intake um, right next to the occlutenate Lake campground. The powerhouse is up in the upper right hand corner over on the Knick arm. And then you can see the Eklutna River coming out of Eklutna Lake um, and all the other things we have going on in the basin. So we have AWU's um, pipeline and tunnel that branch off of the power tunnel and go down the river and up to the AWU water treatment plant. Um, we have the the old dam site that's right there next to the the AWU power treatment plant or water treatment plant um, that dam has since been removed in 2018 uh, by the conservation fund and the Clinton Inc. Um, then we get into the anadromous reach of the river and the confluence with Thunderbird Creek. Um, below that we have some existing bridges including the old Glen Highway Bridge, the new Glen Highway Bridges and the railroad bridges. Um, over in the tail race area by the powerhouse, we also have um, the Eklutna salmon hatchery, which is owned by Cook Inlet Aquaculture, um, but currently is not being operated as a full uh, for production purposes. It's actually being used by ADFNG for, um, for about three weeks out of the year uh, for, for stocking that tail race for the Eklutna tail race day use fishing access site that's also maintained by ADFNG and it is a very popular fishery up there. Um, and then coming back down to the lake, we obviously have the campground, but that's also within Chugach State Park. And we have the popular Eklutna Lakeside Trail that follows the, I guess, the northeast side of the of the lake and um, and all the way down to the glacier. So that's just a kind of a quick overview of the area itself. And again, I think it's a good visual representation of all the different um, stakeholders we have here and, and other things that are going on in the basin. Obviously, we have the village, we have the state park, we have the, the water project, the power project, and, and recreational facilities and, and whatnot. So I think that's a good overview. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Perfect. So um, shortly after we met with you guys in, in February, we added some additional technical experts to our team uh, to expand our project team. Um, we had identified in-stream flows and geomorphology as being some very key issues on this project. So we've added our two consultants um, based out of Washington uh, as our in-stream flow and fisheries experts. And then we've also added watershed geodynamics based out of Homer, Alaska as our geomorphology and sediment transport experts. Um, and we also beefed up our meeting facilitation and communications team. We have Ali Harvey with Information Insights as our meeting facilitator. And then we have Joy Huntington, who's on the phone today as um, our stakeholder and outreach support uh, and specialist. Um, the project owners have also committed to some uh, an enhanced status for the native village of Eklutna and have recently with, met with um, village uh, uh, elders and uh, the tribal council, I believe, and, and had some ongoing discussions with them and we're continuing consultation with the village. Um, and we'll we'll talk more about that later, but we just uh, wanted to point that out here. So next slide. Perfect. Um, one of the big things we did earlier this year was we developed an initial information package. Um, this is essentially just a compilation of all the existing relevant information. So um, the historical development going on in the basin, things re, uh, related to the project operations and facilities, um, the existing environment, including 
fisheries, hydrology, geology, recreation, land ownership, land management, um, cultural resources, uh, and, and impacts of the project on uh, those fish, uh, those resources, and then potential um, mitigation measures that have been suggested by others thus far. So this was really just kind of our jumping off point to get everyone on the same page, make sure we're all working with the same basis of information and, and get all that information into one place so it's easily accessible for everybody. Um, the draft IIP and reference documents were uploaded to the project website in March. We had a stakeholder meeting in April to review the draft IIP and uh, address any preliminary questions or comments people had. Um, and then the written deadline for comment or the, the deadline for written comments was on April 24th, the week after. Um, we received several comment letters and uh, worked to review those comment letters. We developed a comprehensive comment response table and have since posted the final IIP um, and that comment response table on the project website as well. So next slide. Can I briefly interrupt, please? Oh, sure. uh, for the record, I would note that uh, Mr. Presverdia and um, Mr. Dunbar, as well as Mr. Weddleton have arrived at the meeting. Thank you. OK, great. Um, another thing we did earlier this year was we worked with Quantum Spatial to acquire some aerial imagery, spherical videography and LIDAR data in May. Um, you will have a you can see a link to that spherical videography there. Um, and I believe we are going to open that link and show you uh, some some video from that. And I, Brian, if you can do that. Yep, I will do that. It just takes me a second here. I, I'm OK, gonna... no problem. Here we go. While you're doing that, I'll uh, I'll further describe it. So we basically we did the entire length of the Eklutna River and as well as the shoreline, the northeast shoreline of Eklutna Lake. Um, and again, that's because of the lakeside trail along the lake and then obviously of all the interest in the river and and downstream of the project. So we now have um, spherical videography, which is, I think, really, it's been extremely helpful thus far, and we're looking for new ways to incorporate that into our study planning and implementation going forward. Um, but we have a higher elevation video going upstream, and then the helicopter uh, did a U-turn and came downstream at a lower elevation. Um, that link is also available on our website if you want to peruse that later, um, or if you have any questions about it, you know, obviously, or if you need some technical assistance, feel free to reach out to us and we can help you out with that. Um, perfect. And then we also have some high resolution aerial um, imagery and accompanying so, LIDAR data that's going to be extremely beneficial. Um, so can you all see the, can you see the video now? It it's not moving. It's not, oh, there we go. It looks like it's starting to move. Yes, we can see it. Um, should I take you up to the dam or? Can we just fly a little bit? Um, I think there were, so this gives a good kind of view of what you can see. Uh, Brian, if you could kind of move the the video around so people get the spherical, the spherical effect. There we go. Yeah, so it's basically a 3D video, right? You can pause it, you can slow it down, you can move it around just like you would in, say, Google Earth or something, and, and basically just take a journey, a, a virtual site reconnaissance, if you will, up the river um, to to see this area that people are so passionate about. Um, and then I think there were a few areas that uh, Julie wanted us to point out. I don't know if you have those listed in front of you, Brian. If not, I can I can pull them up, but I think it was segment 11. Is that right, Julie? Yeah, I'm gonna do, I think I'll go over that when I get to actually to the lake side there. So we'll go back to this then. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Well, then you can handle that, Brian. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this is available. The link is on the website and uh, feel free to play around with it. You can also see there's a, a map on the right hand side that shows you where you are in the river um, and then you can toggle between segments in the upper left uh, upper left hand corner. I believe it is. Um, so segments one through seven go upstream at a higher elevation and then segments eight through 14 come downstream um, at a lower elevation. And again, it goes all the way to the end of the lake. And segment 11 gets you to the dam and the campground area. So if you're looking for that. Exactly. Perfect. All right. So I'll go back to the PowerPoint now. Yes, that'd be great. Awesome. 
Awesome, perfect. Um, yeah, so I think that covers that and we can go to the next slide. Just takes me a second here. I'm waiting for my screen to catch up. Oh, uh, is your computer catching up? There we up? go. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, great. So, and then shortly, uh, shortly after we had that meeting in April, we um, established what we're calling a technical work group uh, in May, June timeframe. And really, it's more of an aquatics technical work group. The purpose of this um, is to really focus in on uh, our study planning process and the technical expertise that's going to be needed to develop those study plans in coordination with the, the appropriate agencies and representatives, um, and then actually coordinate, continuing coordination with this technical work group through study implementation. Um, so since every, uh, the, the main focus of this project right now is, is really the aquatics aspect, right? The flows, the fish, um, we really we reached out to who we thought would be um, great representatives and then we also asked for anyone who else wanted to volunteer their time uh, to participate in this technical work group and so um, right now the technical work group consists of the native village of Aklutna, uh the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, National Marine Fishery Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Trout Unlimited, uh, staff from the Alaska Pacific University who are currently doing research in the basin, the Alaska Institute for Climate and Energy, and the project owners themselves uh, via our technical team. Um, and we have representatives, one or two representatives from each of these entities, and we've been meeting on a regular basis thus far. Um, we're also looking to expand our technical work group for some uh, infrastructure related studies that we're going to talk about later. Um, so I think that covers that. Perfect. About the same time that we were establishing the technical work group, we developed um, or refined what we're calling our information matrix. The, uh, the draft was included in the IIP, um, the draft IIP, and then we, when we received comments, we further revised and met with the stakeholder group again to, um, I don't want to say finalize because it is a working document, but to revise it further. So the information matrix is really the first step in developing our study plans. It identifies what information will be needed to compare the potential alternatives in the future. Um, so again, it's kind of trying to make sure that we are developing and uh, our, our study program so that we get all the information we need in order to make those hard decisions later, right? The last thing we want to do is is get to the end of our study program and realize, you know, all oh, shucks, we forgot to gather wetlands information and then have to have to go back. So in order to avoid that, we've developed this matrix and in consultation with the stakeholders and um, all the items you see there, all of our key resource parameters, um, are, are what made it onto the information matrix, including you know, how we're going to measure it and quantify it and, and so forth. So we have fish habitat, water quality, macroinvertebrates, wetlands, wildlife, recreation, cultural, carbon benefits, safety, municipal water supply, downstream bridges and property, that salmon hatchery that's um, out in the tail race, power production, and then obviously costs. So I think that's good. Let me go to the next slide, perfect. Um, and then later in the summer, we conducted some additional site visits. Um, we conducted our first site visit as a consultant team last year in August 2019. And like I said, since then, we've added some additional technical experts to our team. So um, we felt it was necessary to get them out in the field as well, right? It's sometimes you just have to see it <laughs> more. And I can describe it to you all day long, but just going out in the field and seeing something is, is so much more valuable. So. We conducted a um, our first technical work group meeting actually in, on July 15th to prep for that site visit. Um, make sure if there was anything, uh, you know, the technical work group really wanted us to focus on that we were able to devote to time to that. And then we conducted the site visit um, later in July and held a follow up technical work group meeting immediately after on July 3rd to officially kind of kick off our study planning effort. Um, and you'll see there that we actually conducted a second uh, site visit in August, and that's because one of our technical experts was unable to attend the July visit. So we just we went out there a little bit later so that she was able to get out there as well. And then I believe we have some pictures. There we go. Showing our, our site reconnaissance. The picture on the left is the upper Kootenai River uh, just below um, the existing project dam. You can see our team is actually standing in the dry riverbed there. 
Um, and then the picture on the right hand side is uh, the lower Akutna River. We're actually right under the New Glen Highway bridges. And so um, most of that water you see in the right picture is uh, coming out of Thunderbird Creek, um, which is the, the primary tributary to Akutna River at this time. And since no water is coming past the dam, the, the picture on the left shows the dry riverbed um, in the fall. Perfect. And then so also in August, we had our geomorphologists establish some transects in the river and install some scour monitors. Um, just a, a transect is the same thing as a cross section for anyone who's wondering. It's basically just establishing a point in the river that we can go back to over and over and over again to monitor change. Um, and so that picture on the left is just a, an example of some flagging uh, XS1 cross section one. Um, that that marks a transect, for example. And then if you're interested in what a scour monitor is, we've included a diagram there on the right. Um, it's basically just a device that tells you how much sediment has moved after, say, a flood event, right? If if you if a large amount of water goes down the river and it scours out a bunch of sediment, we can measure that um, if we've installed scour monitors ahead of time. So um, just kind of in preparation for our for our study program, uh, we went ahead and did that here. Um, we also in August, we conducted a condition assessment of the spillway and there's also a drainage outlet gate at the base of the spillway. Um, the purpose of this condition assessment was really to just uh, see if there were any structural concerns with the spillway that would prevent us from intentionally spilling water um, and also to evaluate the condition of that drainage outlet gate. And the reason is um, one of the primary mitigation measures that people have requested and is probably one of the most obvious ones is for fish is to release water back into the river. And currently the only mechanism we have to do that is that drainage outlet gate. And so in order to answer the questions regarding how much water and when and uh, and what duration of flows and all those kind of water questions to come up with a potential future flow regime, we have to actually release a little bit of water into the river as part of our studies. And so we're hoping to be able to use that drainage outlet gate um, to release uh, short bursts. And when I say short bursts, probably about a week's worth of water um, at three different um, flows into the river during at some point next year. And so we had to do a condition assessment to see if we could actually use that gate. And the reason is, is because even though that gate exists, it's not actually utilized on any kind of regular basis. It's actually almost never utilized. Um, the purpose of the gate is actually to drain the water um, on the upstream side of the dam in this little pond that we're, we're going to show you later. Um, but uh, during the winter so that there's no ice freeze effect on on the concrete spillway or on the dam itself. Um, but it that gate hasn't actually been fully opened in, in several decades, I believe it is. Um, it looks like someone has a question when I'm finished. Perfect. Uh, OK, great. And so one thing we did find out was that uh, there's really no, there are no big structural concerns with the spillway, so that's great. Um, a couple, you know, a couple minor things here and there, but nothing that wasn't to be expected. Um, we weren't able to make any conclusive determinations about the drainage outlet gate because uh, we actually threw an, an ROV into the water to try and get down into the water and look at the gate itself, but realized there's actually a bunch of debris and rocks blocking the gate um, underwater. And so one of our first uh, items, one of our first to do items in the spring of next year is going to be to get some divers out to the dam and clear away that debris um, so that we can, under control, controlled conditions, try to incrementally operate that gate um, and get it to, to fully open, right? It's, um, it's metal, it's been underwater for, for 60 plus years and it hasn't been fully opened in decades. So um, I, I imagine some lubrication will be needed. <laughs> but, um, and then we're also going to be installing a trash rack in front of the gate um, to ensure that if any more debris does build up, you know, it wouldn't get stuck in the in the gate when we do open it. So assuming we can do all three of those things in the spring, clear out the debris, fully operate the gate and install a trash rack. Um, it's our our belief that we should be able to use that gate to release flows um, next year for study purposes. And oh, there we go. Another good picture. So that's kind of standing on top of the on top of the dam looking 
upstream towards the lake over the spillway. And you can see there's kind of where Mike's uh, pointer is right there. That's how you would actually access that gate. There's a kind of a little manhole that someone has to crawl down into and manually uh, manually open that gate. So there's no uh, power out there currently. And, and that's one of the restrictions that we're, we're trying to work around. Awesome. Why don't we take Mr. Dunbar's question, if you don't mind? Perfect. Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair of the committee. Um, very uh, quickly, and I apologize if you sort of said this, but I missed it. Um, so some of our advocates this summer and last summer have been asking for what they call a flushing flow. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that, is, is, are these three short, you know, three week long flows, are those equivalent to what they're talking about when they say flushing flow? That's a fabulous question. And um, I'm actually going to get to get to some of that later, but we can start to answer that question now. So um, really, one of the things we have to do is define what a flushing flow is and talking to different people. We've heard all kinds of different numbers, you know, everything from 1000 CFS down to 50 CFS. Um, when we talk about these controlled flow releases next year, and this is an approach we've discussed with the technical work group, um, those flow releases will be what we can put through that gate and that gate can take up to about 190 CFS when the um, reservoir is full at the spillway crest. So currently we're proposing um, probably, I'm, I'm gonna throw out some numbers there, but I'll say about 25 CFS, uh, 75 CFS and maybe 150 CFS uh, flows in that range um, for next year. And each of those flows should last about a week and then they would, um, uh, and so three flows, one week each, um, probably next fall is what we're going to be hoping to achieve. Now, what we've discussed with the technical work group is being able to use the data that we collect from those flows to um, calibrate the models we're going to develop next year to determine if some kind of larger, what we're calling channel maintenance flow or flushing flow um, is would be warranted for our study in order to help inform our future fish and wildlife program and if so we can use that data to help better define what that flushing flow would be since we can't really define it at this point um, what would be needed and then once we have that information we can work on possibly doing a larger flow or what we'll call spill event intentional spill event possibly in in 2022 um, so that's kind of our series of events that we've worked out with the technical work group thus far. Um, and uh, we have a lot of boxes to check between now and then, but that's that's our current trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. OK, great. Uh, what? I'm just oh, I don't dishes. probably not. I do it every night. I try to let over this. Chris, Chris uh, you, you. Or just a silly girl. Mr. Dun oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> All right, great. So, um, perfect. So next, okay, here we go. We we also developed our study program framework, um, and this was based on that information matrix that we were talking about, and again, based on our technical work group discussions. Um, and the study program framework was really just a, a broad general outline of what studies we're going to conduct over our two year period, which studies are gonna be initiated in year one versus which studies were gonna be initiated in year two. Um, Generally, the year two studies are going to heavily rely on what we learn in year one, and that's why they've been slated for year two. And, uh, and then we also went through some proposed um, methods and general goals and objectives and got tried to get everyone on the same page with that before we moved forward with developing um, our study plan. So the technical work group meeting on September 3rd and uh, to review all of that. Um, and that included the proposed studies themselves, the study objectives, study areas, methodologies, study outline, and, this, and uh, preliminary study planning schedule. Move to the next slide. Perfect. And here is a list of our proposed studies. And again, this has been in coordination with the technical work group. Um, one thing I'll note is even though we kind of have things split out into year one studies and year two studies, uh, many of our year one studies are actually slated to be two year um, efforts and so they will carry into year two. So even though they're not listed in year two, um, I guess we should say these are the studies that will be initiated in each year. Um, but you'll see there we have our big in-stream flow study, which is really the, the, the crux of our entire study program is trying to answer the question about how much water to put down the river and when um, to, to benefit, benefit fish the most. 
Um, the other really big study that we have going on that's also kind of at the center of everything is our geomorphology and sediment transport study. Um, there's a big sediment issue in the river, right? We have very large natural sediment inputs in the in the upper river, and then there's still some accumulated sediment in the lower river behind the lower dam site, and figuring out how that sediment is going to move and how will it, it will affect fish habitat is going to be one of our big questions that we need to answer. And then we have, um, you know, everything else you see listed there, trying to basically fill in that information matrix, right? Uh, water quality, macroinvertebrates, um, you can see recreation, wildlife, wetlands, cultural, all that's represented in year two. We also have a suite of our um, engineering type studies, our infrastructure assessment, hydro operations modeling, engineering feasibility and cost assessment, um, lake shoreline erosion, all that good stuff. So just really trying to make sure we do a comprehensive effort and looking at um, all potential impacts and, and benefits for that matter. I'm going to go to the next slide. Great, so flow releases for studies. <laughs> here we're getting, getting at your question here, um, Forrest. So the project owners have committed to flow releases for study purposes contingent on some of the following prerequisites. Um, first and foremost, we wanna address any and all safety concerns, uh, right? If, we, if we're releasing water from the dam and you know, the general public is not used to water being released from the dam, uh, trying to make sure we develop the appropriate safety plans to make sure people are not in the lower river at, when we're releasing large flows down the river. Um, we need to define those flow releases, again, magnitude, duration, timing, and develop the study plans for them. Um, conduct condition assessment of the spillway and drainage outlet gate. Again, that's what kind of what we started to do earlier this year and will hopefully complete um, in the spring of next year. Evaluate impacts to existing fish habitat and utilization. Um, evaluate impacts to the downstream infrastructure, uh, right? If we're releasing a flow, flows into the river that are not um, normal, could they have uh, or not normal for the current flow regime, I guess? Could they have negative impacts on downstream infrastructure that has been built in the time that this project has existed? Um, impacts of the lakeside trail and associated infrastructure in order to release these flows we have to hold the reservoir at a higher level um, we already have some reports of erosion occurring along the lakeside trail when the reservoir is at a higher level so evaluating what impacts what additional impacts may occur um, and then also the cost of providing those flows and assessing the feasibility and then addressing any kind of legal concerns um, regarding you know liability or um, any other number of things so that's kind of the, the list of prerequisites that we've already started to work through and will continue to work through uh, throughout the, the end of the year and into early next year so that we can hopefully release these flows for study purposes in the fall, in the in next fall. Go to the next slide. Um, and again, um, we, oh. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I'm, I just wanted to, this is Curtis McQueen calling remotely. So at some point at the end of the presentation, I'd like to give the group an update um, on behalf of the native village of the Klutna, um, and I'll also make a comment about the uh, flow and the history of that river that sure. we've lived with with that flow, but uh, I'll mute myself for right now. Thank you, Curtis. I'll have you uh, up later. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we have some ongoing consultation with the native village of Aklutna. We hinted at this earlier. Um, in June 2020, the project owners committed to an enhanced status uh, for the native village of Aklutna under this 1991 Fish and Wildlife Agreement process, um, which includes utilizing the village's expertise throughout our process, incorporating their traditional ecological knowledge, holding additional coordination meetings with the village, um, sharing all documents directly with the village for feedback, and submitting a uh, village specific comment summary to the governor um, whenever we submit our proposed fish and wildlife program. Um, and as I stated before, the project owners met with NVE on September 30th and are, uh, I think, continuing uh, this coordination um, throughout the rest of our process and, and ongoing. Next slide. Awesome. So the schedule for the remainder of 2020. Um, this brings us to uh, expanding the technical work group and drafting our year one study plans is what we're currently doing. Um, those draft study plans will be submitted to, or distributed to the technical work group later this month for review and comment. Um, and then we'll have a big meeting with the technical work group to review their comments and conduct additional consultation with the village at that time towards the end of November. Um, and then once we've gotten everybody's feedback, 
We'll prepare a, a comment response table and finalize the year one study plans in early December. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Agreement requires us to get uh, approval on the scope of work and the study plans from the signatories to the agreement. So we'll be doing that in December and January, maybe early January, and submitting those plans to the governor for, for his review, also uh, required by the 1991 Fish and Wildlife Agreement. Next slide. Great. And then so next steps in early 2021. Um, after we submit our plans to the to the governor and obtain his feedback, we'll discuss the governor's feedback with the technical work group and revise the study plans as needed and as agreed upon by the technical work group. Um, we'll obtain any necessary permits or access permissions for conducting our studies address any of those remaining prerequisites we talked about before for study flow releases and then actually implement our study plans. So that'll be great. The next slide. Oh, and that goes into Brian's Brian's slide. So I think that's it for me. Unless we want to stop for questions or maybe we'll take questions at the end. How do you want to do that, Brian? Uh, so we are talking down questions on time. now. Uh, this is Mr. Cronson. I don't see any questions yet, and uh, we are down to 20 minutes left in this committee, so hopefully maybe five more minutes before we pivot to uh, comments and other topics. Sure, I'll go quickly through this. I just wanted to, uh, Brian Hickey with Chugach Electric, and I just kind of wanted to walk you all through some of the mechanics around spilling water, and, and, and um, some of it's been alluded to by Samantha earlier, and so I'll kind of move through this fairly quickly. Um, just to reorient again, you know, there's a whole, there's a raft of infrastructure downstream of the dam. And just to, we went through this earlier, but you're at the lake up here where the cursor is. The intake goes through a tunnel and down to the Kinnick, Kinnick River down here where the uh, tail race and the a, a Department of Fish and Game Fishery is. There's a black uh, line right here, which is the tap off the tunnel that goes through under the underground and comes out in a pipeline over here. And then the AWU pipeline is in the river uh, corridor down to the AWU treatment. Here, here you have the lower dam. Um, and then you have the two bridges on the old and the new Glen Highway and then the railroad bridge, as well as the fish habitat that's located downstream. So whenever we look at spills, we're looking at all of those issues and how any amount of water that we would release would affect the downstream infrastructure. At the top of the, whoop, lost my cursor there. This is the remnants of the previous dam, and this is the new dam, and now I'll show you kind of what that looks like. Um, if you come to the Occlutena campground and you walk down to the shoreline, you're sort of standing right where the cursor is there. Looking to your left, you'd see the intake, although the intake is at the bottom of the lake at 714 foot elevation. And then looking to your right, you might be able to see part of the old dam, which is that purple dot. Um, I was going to fly over the dam here and I given that I only have five minutes I'm not going to show you the flight over the dam so I'll just skip over that um, I'd hope to do that but here's a, a fixed picture of it and what you're seeing here is the lake in May and sort of this glacial moraine area at the head of the lake the intake structure is at the bottom of the lake over here the access to the AWU bla that black line is right here in the AWU line kind of runs in that general direction and it's under under the underground and then if you come up here this point is kind of important right here this is the the remnants of the previous storage dam and that was the pre-1965 dam it's at i believe 861 and i'll have a diagram that shows the actual elevations of this in a moment and then there's a pond that forms right here this pond when the lake is below 861, this pond is filled by a little creek that comes in right here. And here is the spillway that you looked at earlier. And this is the actual Eklutna Dam right here. So you can see that in May, there is no water up to the dam. Uh, the water's down quite a ways, nearly a mile away is actually the actual lake elevation. Um, the little place where the guy has to crawl down in and, and to open the gate is right where my cursor is right there. So that's sort of a, an overall view of the dam structure and what the lake elevation is with respect to the dam structure in the springtime. Today, the lake is at about 869. Uh, so it's 1.8 feet below spill. So this entire area would be filled up with water today that you see in the spring is empty. 
Um, so that's just sort of a, the most recent. And for the last two days, it's been going down about a tenth of a foot per day. Um, some key uh, key um, elevations. I'm sorry, I've said 714. I meant 794 is the intake at the bottom of the lake. 814 is as low as we will run the lake, uh, lower the lake, and that's because of the uh, a sort of a whirlpool that forms around the, the the intake structure and the possibility of maybe a kayaker or something get getting caught in that. So 814 is as low as we will bring the lake down. 852 is the drainage gate outlet, and that's the, the gate that Samantha was talking about. And you can see that the crest of the national natural um, glacial moraine, that big area I showed you, as well as the old dams is about an 860. So you have about an eight foot difference between the old dam and the and the actual gate. And I'll show you another diagram here that hopefully makes that a little more clear. Um, the spillway crest is at 871. That's where we would actually spill water through that uh, tunnel we looked at. And then the dam crest is at 891. Um, we talked about the 30 by 30 um, drainage gate, and I won't go into that in any greater detail other than it can release about 191 cubic feet per second when the water level is at the spillway. And that might be easiest to kind of bring all these numbers together on this diagram here. What you have here is just relative elevations on the left side here, the tunnel opening at 794 roughly, the minimum operating level for the lake at 814, the pond, the sheet pile elevation, and if you look over here, um, the original dam is represented by this red line right here, the pre-65 dam. And so the lake has to come up and come over that dam to actually fill up the pond that we looked at earlier here. Um, this represents, this red structure here represents the actual dam and the spillway kind of goes through here and down and drops into the Occlutna River where my cursor is running right there. So for us to spill water, we have to breach the, breach the dam, or, or not breach the dam, but the elevation needs to come above 8, 860 and on up to 871, which is the spillway right here, and then water will flow over the top of the dam through the spillway. Alternatively, we can open that 30 by 30 gate, which is here at about 852, and you could let some water out. This curve that I see the, that's shown at the bottom here, which has along the x-axis, zero to 200 uh, cubic feet per second, and along the y-axis is lake level elevation going upwards. You can see that when the lake is at um, 871, you can put out about 191 cubic feet per second. As you begin to drain that pond or the lake level down, you will, you, the, the amount of water that can actually pass through that tunnel gets smaller and smaller until eventually it gets to zero when the lake level drops below, when the water level drops below 852. So for us to actually spill water, first of all, we have to get it up over the old dam here, located here. Then we have to rate, let the lake level get above 871 and then we could spill water. If we were to open this gate, we could drain this pond and spill some water out of this pond, or we could wait till the lake was above the uh, above the sheet pile dam and then use this as well. The challenge we have right now, as Samantha referred to, is if a rock or something gets stuck underneath that gate, we may not be able to close it. And so we are working on that. As she said, we're going to send divers down next year to make sure we have a trash rack on the front of that and we've gotten anything out of the way that, that would potentially go in under it. Um, this is a picture again of that access point, and I won't go over that. This is a little bit of information, historical information on the dam, and and this is sort of the typical, um, these are the curves of lake elevation. You have elevation on the left, and you have months of the year on the right, uh, on the lower axis, on the x-axis or the horizontal axis. And then you can see each color is a different year, and so this is sort of what Occluton has done over the years. Um, one of the most interesting one is this this line right here, which I'll talk about on another slide. Um, and that's so that. I might interrupt. We have a question and we are really running out of time. So uh, I know that there are others that want to talk. So, uh, Mr. Dunbar, you can grab your question. Yeah, just be very quick because I do want to hear from Clutin and others. But um, so I think we've almost all been out to the spillway um, and been on top of it. Um, 
I, I thought there was also a small stream that ran directly into the pond and not into a Klutna Lake. And so yeah. is that so small that doesn't make any difference? Or um, yes. is there some water that could go through that spillway, even if the the lake wasn't, you know, to the point where it was going into the pond? Yes, that, pond, that, that, that is this little line where my cursor is on the screen right here. And it keeps that pond, there is water in that pond uh, from that, even when the lake has drained out, as you can see right here. And a, a spill of that nature would be controlled, would, would be, you know, physically is driven by this curve right here. So you have to get the pond up to the spillway, which it can't get up to the spillway to get the 191 out because it will drain back over into the lake back here. This is at 860 here, and that's at 871. So at 860, you could potentially get a little over 100 cubic feet per second out at any given time. Does that make sense? I think so. All right, thank you. If I might, uh, from Julie, she suggests that we proceed to questions, and I want to let you find, kind of do your last key point here, but we definitely are down to 13. So Sure. I'll just, I'll finish up here really quickly. I think the, the one thing, you know, the, the, the lake has spilled nine times since 1967, um, and the one thing that I want to emphasize is once we get the dam up, get, get the lake up to the spillway, spills after that point in time are uncontrolled. Uh, we have limited ability to draw the lake down. You know, we can draw down about 0.9 acre feet per hour with both units running at full speed. So in an event like we had in, in, in 1995, you can see that over a period of a week, the lake went up 10 feet and spilled. That was the biggest spill I believe we've seen. We had about a thousand cubic feet per second going over the spillway. One of the challenges is once we get the lake up to that spillway, if we have a large rain event, there is no ability to, to limit that spill. It will be whatever nature um, intended it to be. And, and so there is a challenge there for us from uh, both from, from a, the perspective of what may happen to infrastructure downstream, including the existing fish habitat down at the lower river. So with that, I'll take the questions. Thank you very much. And uh, before we move into questions from members, as an interested party, I am going to ask uh, Eklutna, Native Village of Eklutna, Curtis McQueen, if he would like to join now. Uh, yes. Uh, All right, you have the floor. Can you? Uh, you're chopping in and out. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, first of all, I wanna commend the whole team and the utilities of what they've put together. It's been a very positive experience. I have been working um, with the Conservation Fund and with the Native Village of Eklutna. We had a fantastic meeting on September 3rd. Uh, it was started in April. The tribe sent a letter to the utilities wanting to be brought in as a stakeholder more formally, because uh, in the 1991 agreement, uh, we the people were overlooked. Um, there's some technical and legal reasons that we're being told, and we understand that we are not going to be on the 91 agreement as a signee when it goes to the governor, but they have done everything they can to make sure that we're in the room and communicating. The tribe um, set up a meeting at the Native Heritage Center on September 30th. We had the three CEOs or two CEOs in the general manner, but uh, all utility executive team was there. Uh, so was Julie Esty and Julie Haskett. Uh, and then interest from some of the utility board members. So we had a board member from MEA and we had two board members from Chugach and we all recognize we're about to draw down to two utilities. The premise of the meeting was to let each elder and each tribal member of the council speak. And for about an hour, hour and a half, um, each council member got up in front of a mic or if they were zoomed in and spoke about what that river had meant to them as children, what it had meant to them um, now, and their hope to have water down that watershed. And it was a great experience. Uh, the utilities heard them, I mean, heard them clearly. And then we had the utilities come up and speak. And the question was uh, to the utilities, um, we need water and we need it now. And when, when can we have water? And will you at least commit and have an open 
find at the end of this process, if not sooner, to get water down that watershed. The feedback we got, even though they spoke very carefully and due to legal reasons, uh, the commitment we all believed we heard from all of them was that yes, the goal would be to get more water down that watershed. So we felt good about that meeting. There is some fish that have made it above uh, this summer, have made it above the old dam that when, when I was at Eklutna, we took down. Um, Fish and Game has spotted it. So as the conservation fund, we found some coho that's gotten up. One of the big reasons we need more water uh, coming down is to make that river deeper because a lot of people don't realize or don't know it's a king salmon stream. We know all fish are important, but at least we know in Cook Inlet and in the valley and what king salmon and a strong run can mean. The tribe knows and is prepared to have to open that up to a public fishery at some point in the future when we get that river restored and it gets deeper water and the fish are back, they're prepared for that. Um, and that's gonna be a good problem to have. Um, in the 15 years that I was CEO at Eklutna, we would occasionally get a call about a spillway. Usually I can remember Jim Posey or some of his members would call us and just give us a heads up that they were gonna spill water down. And, they, and there was never any technical issue. Nobody ever got hurt. There was no damage to the roads or the bridges. And the villagers would notice when the water uh, level raised. And so now that there's a formal study going on and risk management is being addressed, we get that. But I just wanna make sure everybody realizes that there has been spills uh, controlled and sometimes due to large storms, it's done no damage down there. And the request of the tribe is, and this year was, could you at least do a few spills to wash the remaining sediment out from where that old dam was taken down for, for 80 years? It was a lot of sediment built up. We took that dam down. Naturally, some of that settlement sediment is coming down the stream now, but a couple of flushes of that uh, this year, or at least next year, can clear that out to get right down to the river bottom. I'll close by saying it's been a positive experience uh, for the tribe. I don't, I, I'm on the phone. I, I don't know if there's anybody else there from NBE, but I'm working with them and I was in the room. And so far we're feeling pretty good about the process, but we do need, um, more water down that watershed consistently. With that, I'll, uh, um, I'll stop or answer any questions, but thank you for the meeting today. Uh, thank you, Curtis. And um, and in the chat, uh, Ms. Haskett from Chugach Electric says they're happy to provide more frequent updates to the committee. So it's not so much information at once. I do look forward to scheduling a standing quarterly meeting. And are there any other questions from members of the assembly? OK, I haven't heard any. Are there any questions from stakeholders who have been involved in this process who would like to be recognized briefly? I have maybe one or two minutes. I think you would hit a star six if you're on the call in number. Hearing none, I think that I'm going to suggest that we submit your briefing as uh, accepted and we thank you and um, I am not sure the next steps other than like I suggested just now and request will we'll work to set up a quarterly much more consumable briefing and with that I'm going to uh, under the second item of the agenda other business move us forward to a, a final assembly briefing on the transaction of MLMP to Chugash Electric, and after about two weeks from now, it will be a different relationship, and yet surely still a good one. So, Mr. Thiebert, Lee, please take the floor. All right. Um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity, and I know we're just really running short on time, um, but I just want to tell you that I do appreciate, you know, we've been working on this. Our first presentation to the Enterprise Committee was May 18th of 2017. So we've been at this for a little over three and a half years and I can tell you we're now within two weeks and I think we're, we're very ready to go. Um, so things are looking very well um, for closing on on the 30th. I'd really like to give recognition to the mayor, the administration team and MLMP management for their leadership and commitment to the community. And it's, it hasn't been an easy process to divest a utility that's been going on since 1932. 
So it, it's been a, a very viable organization, and I know it's been very difficult for, for all the employees. They've been in limbo now for about three years, and I really have to take my hat off to everybody that have been trying to run a utility, doing the um, integration of going into one utility, and then dealing with COVID-19 and all the other issues that are going on. So my hat's off to the entire team on both sides at MLP and Chugach for the great effort that they've been doing. And you know we've done all this very safely, and I know on Chugach's side, we haven't had a lost time injury in almost two years now. Um, so excellent, excellent record of everybody keeping in mind the primary importance of safety and reliability to, to the members. So I just want to thank, thank everybody. Um, really, like we said, in less than two weeks, we are going to be one Anchorage utility. Um, on the financing efforts, just to give you an update, um, we can't say a lot because of SEC um, regulations, but we have complied with the asset purchase agreement and you're free to talk to the administration, but we have things in place with financing. Um, I want to say a few things about kind of the immediate benefits that will come, and it's really going to be in on the fuel side. We're not going to probably do a rate case where you'll see any physical rate changes for until 2023, but you will start to see immediate benefits in fuel. So there is a $36 million credit that goes to the MLMP legacy customers, and I think really uh, customers from both MLMP side and you get side, we'll see a reduction in overall rates are probably in the five to six percent range. So although it's small, it will be um, coming out after um, the first of the year. Um, some of the things to expect. Um, the, the mailers are going out and, you know, a lot of you, if you're in the MLP area, you'll get a flyer that kind of tells you how to do the changeover um, and then just making sure you follow the you know all the protocols and giving you information on who to call making available the websites that are out there so i think there's a lot of information that uh, customers can, can can get to to make sure we have as smooth a transition as possible um, you'll kind of hear about the new designations of south campus and north campus the mlp will be north campus and, and chugach existing as a south campus so you might hear some of that language coming up. Um, really, you know, we're focused on trying to have as seamless a transition as possible, but I just, I, I beg everybody to be patient with us. We're gonna try to do the best we can, but if this complicated, I can expect there'll be a few glitches along the way. So anyway, what I'd like to do is open it up for, for any questions. I know we're really running short on time and I'd yep. be happy to give a, I'm Thank you. Later on, we will definitely have you back once we started rolling for how things are being implemented. Is there anybody on the body who has a question for Mr. Thiebert? OK, I do have one question hearing none, and it was raised to me and you just kind of alluded to it, I think, and that's this North Campus concept. We never, I don't believe, saw a final list of properties that would be purchased and properties that wouldn't. And so is such a list available or a map? And uh, can you tell me what the intent is for the properties around First Avenue? OK, Chugach is acquiring all the properties at MLMP. So all of those we kind of talked back and forth about whether we had lease them for a shorter period of time. But ultimately, we decided to acquire all of the facilities and we'll be using all those facilities probably for some transition over probably a seven, maybe a five to 10 year period. So we'll maintain that. And I think what we'll try to do over the years is as we can get into one location, we'll start selling these facilities maybe one at a time. But I could see that it will be at least probably two to three years out before we put anything on the market. All right, thank you very much. And I know we are pretty much out of time, but to the membership, I would uh, like a motion to extend by just five minutes. I know that eats into another committee, but we have a couple of things. So move. Is there a second? Anyone? Anyone? Thanks, All right. Is there any objection? All right. Hearing none, uh, 
there is a question put into the chat. Can we get information on the transition on the customer side to share with our community councils that are covered by MLP, even if it's through a website? Go ahead, Julie. So I can help with that. Um, MLP customers will not be able to actually do the paperwork, if you will, to become a Chugach member until November 4th, which is going to be our first official day of new business. We will have all sorts of information on our website. We are going to have um, a mailer that goes directly to every single MLP customer so they know exactly what their steps are. But yes, I will make sure that information is available for community councils. I'm available to go to community councils. That's part of my commitment. So um, we want to help people transition smoothly, but we, you do have to like redo your auto pay and redo your credit card. We can't just sweep up your information, which I think is a good thing. Um, but yes, uh, we will definitely work with you assembly members. If you need information, feel free to call me. Um, but literally logging in to become a Chugach member will begin officially on November 4th. All right, any last questions before I open it up to uh, members of the public who like to speak under the audience participation? Hearing none, is there anyone from the audience who would like to speak in the last two or three minutes? Hello, hello. Mr. Haberman, you're recognized. Thank you. I'm just going to be really, really brief. As you can call Haberman. I just want to remind you and please make sure there's a hearing for the port at the assembly chambers tomorrow from 1230 to 1:30. Please make sure the doors are open at least a half hour early so they can deal with the COVID uh, check. And thank you very much and I wish you all the best. All right. Anyone else in the public? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Mr. Thiebert, Julie, to your whole team. Um, so what an amazing process. I joined the body the week that this conversation started. And um, although the conversation probably really started 100 years ago, or not 100 years ago, 50 years ago, um, when you guys were founded, like, do we really need all this? And I look forward to the power cost equalization and all of the sharing rules being established so that we can start to move towards the vision and goal of this project, which is a streamlined power utility that makes sense as opposed to too much. And with that, I think thank you is in order and we look forward to having you back as the sole primary provider of power in the municipality. Thank you, everybody. Right, motion thank you. Adjourn, please. But entertain thank a motion. You. Move to adjourn. All right. Thank you, everybody.